Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Donfried. Um, thank you for the opportunity, a little bit unexpected. I was asked yesterday to uh, address the audience, uh, but uh, I really want to seize the opportunity to tell a little bit more about my present work, what I'm doing uh, currently. Uh, I didn't come alone to Berlin. The uh, person you see in the center, uh, the stage is Sam van der Staak, who's my colleague at the uh, uh, International ID Secretariat in Stockholm. And today we uh, had some talks at the um, ministry here with the uh, State Secretary about uh, cooperation with Germany, one of our member states. When I was working uh, for the OECD after leaving government in Belgium, at a certain moment I was asked indeed to take the lead of international idea, to apply for the leadership of international idea. And I first refused, but at a certain moment I decided to say yes, mainly because I think that um, when you look at economic, at social development, it is very obvious that a kind of precondition for the development of societies, for uh, building up a welfare state, for building up a sustainable economic development, that uh, for all these purposes and objectives, you have as a precondition to have a sound, good, effective governance. And I'm convinced that this is only sustainable, the governance you need, when it is underpinned by a um, holistic approach uh, by democratic institutions. I don't know if you read books, but there is a, a very interesting book which was published on the subject. Um, it's called Why Nations Fail. It's a very interesting book. It's uh, written by Mr. Atsimoglu and Mr. Robinson, two professors in the States. And in that book, they tend to prove that the difference between wealthy nations and uh, nations that still are in a stage of pre-development, of underdevelopment, that the difference is not so much the um, presence of natural resources in the soil or all kinds of things that you can see as kind of given, um, like natural resources, like the geographic situation also of a country, but that the real difference between being a wealthy nation, uh, flourishing having a flourishing economy, and on the other hand, uh, poverty under development, is the governance. Why else would there be such a difference between North Korea and South Korea, for instance? Why uh, else explain that Congo, which is the, uh, the richest nation in the world in terms of natural resources, is, I think, the third poorest in the world. It is very clear that there is a lack of governance, uh, of democratic governance, in the case of Congo, in the case of North Korea. That's my belief, and it is underpinned by evidence, by statistics, uh, of which we have lots, uh, of which we have uh, abundance at the OECD. So I decided to join International IDEA, and I would like to tell you a little bit about International IDEA, and then we can engage in uh, Q&A if you uh, uh, are interest, uh, interested in. International ID, in fact, was uh, launched as a intergovernmental institution. So, Mr. Fried, uh, Mr. Donfried, we are not, I say Mr. Friedman, Mr. Donfried, we are not an uh, NGO, we are an IGO, intergovernmental organization um, launched in 1995. So next year we will be 20 years old or 20 years young, uh, very close to the adult, or already adult. Launched in 1995, when um, after the fall of the um, Iron Curtain, the collapse of the Soviet system, there was still a lot of questioning what direction some countries would uh, follow. And then there was a kind of need that was felt uh, within the leadership um, most prominently of some Scandinavian countries, to have a single one global institution that would strengthen, promote, um, and research democracy as a system of governance. And so we have, I think, 14 member states or 14 uh, countries that, that, were, uh, that were convinced, uh, that they could convince to, to join the effort. They launched, uh, the leaders of these countries launched International ID, which stands for International Institution for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, based in Stockholm, in between developed to a um, 
uh, an international governmental organization, intergovernmental organization of uh, 29 member states, 28 effective uh, full member states, and one Japan being a, uh, for internal Japanese uh, political reasons, being an observer of the organization. Very typical to, um, a, um, to international ID, three things. First of all, we are the only global institution in charge of working on democracy, trying to improve democracy, electoral assistance, constitution building, uh, and so on. Number two, we are very typical, a uh, well-balanced north-south uh, organization. We have a membership of 28, 29 member states, and half of these member states are, uh, let's say, mature economies, mature democracies, belong to sometimes the richest nations in the world, the other half being more developing countries, some countries of the third world. Uh, so if I uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about our membership, then we talk about countries from Canada to Australia, Canada, Australia, Japan, uh, India, Indonesia, the biggest democracies in the world, India with uh, uh, last elections, nearly 800 million people casting their votes. Um, lots of European uh, member states, South American uh, also, Peru, Chile, uh, Mexico also, Central America. Um, so a, a global institution with African membership also, South Africa, Botswana, uh, amongst others, uh, some small states also, Dominican Republic, uh, Cap Verde, Cabo Verde, uh, Mauritius, uh, and so on and so on. So number one, a global institution, the only one working on democracy. Two, a north-south institution. Three, very important, a non-prescriptive institution. So we, our, our main objective is not to impose a certain concept of democracy. Now it's to strengthen democracy, but uh, mainly by putting at the disposal of member states and non-member states uh, knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge, practice, experience, uh, best practices in order to strengthen the uh, governance based on uh, democracy all over the world. So 29 member states with, uh, with this objective. Our definition of democracy, by the way, is that it is a system where the supervision of uh, government is um, in the hands of the people and that there is equality among citizens in the exercise of this supervision. That's the, that's the definition we use. But democracy can be different uh, in, in different regions of the world. So we have a non-prescriptive, non-imposing way to uh, work. Our means, our instrument, our tools are um, 150 full-time equivalent of excellent skilled people like Sam van der Staak, who is one of the best examples I took with me today to show you. Uh, but we have 150 people out of uh, 42, 43 nationalities. And they were established for 50% almost in Stockholm and The Hague. Stockholm is the headquarters. The Hague, we have an office on constitutional affairs. Uh, and all the others are spread all over the globe in some 25 to 26 countries with four regional headquarters. Uh, Canberra moving um, shortly to um, uh, Jakarta. We have an office in San Jose in Costa Rica going normally to another place in South America still to decide uh, what uh, city. We have um, in uh, the Asia-Pacific region, so Canberra, Jakarta. In Africa, we have in Wana, the, uh, uh, well, the region where the Arab Spring uh, takes uh, place or took place. We have an office in Tunis and in Africa, we have an office currently in Pretoria, but moving to uh, Addis Abeba. So half of the people in Stockholm and The Hague, half of the people spread all over the globe with, in fact, two kinds of activities. Uh, the activities in Stockholm and uh, mainly also in The Hague is um, building up uh, sources of knowledge, of research, statistics, uh, producing what we call public goods, which are available for uh, all people all over the globe through websites, through documents, through publications. I think, Sam, you took some publications with you. So freely available uh, for everyone about all aspects of democracy. I will elaborate a little bit on that. And then the other half of the people or people that are working in countries to give good advice, to uh, give good consultancy, so to say, to all kinds of public and uh, non-governmental uh, operators that are actors that are active in the field of democracy. We are active in Haiti, in, uh, in South Sudan, in Yemen, in Myanmar, in Nepal. So this is really spread all over um, 
the globe. What are we doing? We have four pillars of activities, uh, mainly. We have electoral assistance. So this relates to all parts of the electoral process. This can be a very, uh, very important theoretical approach of, uh, of elections and how you organize elections uh, to up to very specific, concrete uh, situations or difficulties our member states uh, face. So electoral assistance is the first pillar of activity. The second one being constitution building. It's giving good advice uh, and providing a scientific overview of uh, what's happening in the field of constitution building all over the globe. Good advice to uh, public authorities, parliaments, governments that wants to uh, draft or change uh, constitutions. So that's the second pillar. The third pillar being uh, participation and representation. So what is the kind of interface between citizens and um, and public authority, how do people organize to have the impact, to have this real supervision on governmental activities, how do they build up political parties, how is the civic society organized when it comes to, uh, to politics, uh, what is the role of money in politics, for instance, uh, played by money in politics. Uh, footnote, we just issued issue the book that was written by the two Sams, we call them at uh, International ID, Sam van der Staak and Sam Jones, if I'm uh, right. Um, it's, uh, I think it was published a couple of weeks ago, launched a couple of weeks ago. It's really the best book in the world about the way uh, all over the globe an overview of uh, how political parties are uh, funded by uh, public money, legislation about uh, donations uh, and so on. The role money plays also in terms of, for instance, the capture of the political agenda uh, by uh, through money uh, and so on. So this is the the third pillar of our activities, representation and participation, the role of political parties, programmatic political parties, the role of mass movements, civic society, and so on. Fourth pillar, last but not least, development and democracy. I refer to um, what I said before, the role um, democracy plays in uh, enhancing the chances for countries to uh, develop their economies, develop their uh, society improve the socio-economic situation for their uh, citizens. So these are the four pillars of activities. We have then what we call our cross-cutting, uh, let's say, uh, cross-cutting uh, domains we follow up. It's a gender policy, it's about diversity, it's about conflict and security, where in these three fields we have very specific uh, points of uh, interest. So that's the kind of work we do. We do that work uh, through publications to and through um, uh, consultancy. So uh, to close, uh, why uh, am I in touch with uh, ICD? Um, well, first of all, because in the former position, I had the honor to be the guest at the, uh, one of the guest speakers at uh, conferences here in Berlin, not in this place, but uh, I don't exactly remember where it was, but it was anyway in the premises of uh, ICD, uh, but not here. Um, and I think that um, what we do, working on democracy in a non-prescriptive way, is uh, in one way or another also linked to uh, culture, because the way democracy is formatted by the people and adapted to concrete situation in countries has lots to do with the basic attitudes, with tradition, with the roots of a society, with values, and so I think really that between our work, which is very objective, uh, sometimes very abstract, uh, but also very concrete figures and so on, the whole of our scientific work, also our consultancy work, and your work here uh, at ICD, which is more linked to uh, values, to a vision on man and society and the relationship between uh, mankind and, and society, that we, uh, we have very uh, interesting complementarities and that we can create um, win-win situations where we can add to your curriculum, where we can add to your activities some knowledge we produce, and from the other hand, that you can give us an opportunity to spread our knowledge uh, research uh, activities and what, uh, generally speaking, we produce. So that's it, Mr. Donfried and uh, the people, uh, what I wanted to tell you about International IDEA. Just something to add, we are always looking for talent we have uh, 150 full-time equivalent, approximately, a little bit more. Um, and we tend to offer our people two to three years contracts, which means a, uh, 
well, if you can count, this means that every year we are recruiting uh, some tens of people. And so we publish vacancies on our, on our website. Uh, feel free to consult. And I'm sure that as graduating from uh, ICD here, uh, you could be the right people to, at a certain moment, maybe be interested in what we offer as professional possibilities. Thank you very much, and I'm open to your questions. questions. So first of all, uh, transition to, uh, from a non-democratic governance to a democratic uh, institutional framework. Uh, so first of all, um, next year, just to mention and advertise a little bit, we will uh, be 20 years old as an organization, and we will publish a, uh, a book uh, called Lessons Learned from Leaders. Right? Lessons learned from leaders, which is based on the testimonials of 13 testimonials of people that brought their country from uh, dictatorship to democracy. People that have been chosen very carefully and that are spread all over the globe. It's, uh, for instance, uh, former leaders of Brazil, of Mexico, um, Cardoso, Zedilio, it's uh, Mazowiecki, Kwasniewski from Poland, it's uh, Habibi, Indonesia, it's uh, Mr. Ramos from the Philippines, it's Felipe Gonzalez, uh, Spain, and so on. So 13 people will explain in that book what, uh, to their opinion, was key in terms of attitudes, value, leadership in bringing their country from dictatorship to, um, to a more democratic uh, governance. By the way, Chile is a member state, a very uh, good member state of uh, International idea was uh, the chair two years ago. This year it's uh, Botswana, next year Switzerland. And indeed, Chile uh, has a remarkable record in terms of uh, also socioeconomic development since, uh, the, since there is a democracy with very good transition also after elections and so on. Colombia is not yet a member state, uh, is a candidate member state at the OECD, had the opportunity to, to go to Colombia to consult a little bit the leadership in Colombia, the government, the central bank. Uh, and so on. What we exactly do in that case, in that kind of cases, uh, we are currently working in Myanmar, for instance, in, in that kind of transition, is to uh, give advice to political leaders, to the public authority, on the crucial issues that can make, build up a real democracy. That's, for instance, drafting, adapting the constitution, making a democratic constitution, be there with constitutional specialists, that on the basis of uh, their experience and also an overview of best practices can really advise uh, what is key, what is essential, given also the circumstances, given the situation of the specific country, how a constitution ideally could be drafted. We've done, we are currently doing this in Myanmar, in Nepal. We've done this recently in Tunisia. Uh, in Tunisia, we have been catering for the uh, aspect of the position of women in the Tunisian society and democracy and uh, constitutional uh, articles related to the position of, of women. So that's the kind of work we do. When elections are, um, uh, are organized, we can work on the electoral process. We can, uh, uh, for instance, uh, organize trainings for electoral observers. We can advise political parties how to organize themselves, how to uh, draft um, electoral programs and so on and so on. So that's the kind of work we do. We um, mainly finance by donors. We send out people to the specific countries and these countries engage in a dialogue and interaction with the uh, public authorities in these countries, the political parties, the parliament sometimes, to just uh, give the advice based on experience and best practices of how to do this transition to a, a democracy. Concerning the gender policy, it is one of our cross-cutting um, uh, issues, um, points of interest. It would be, for instance, um, advised that there should be a review of all legislation to make it very concrete, um, help team with, a, um, with people, uh, with women in the country uh, concerned, and review all the legislation and see what parts of the legislation are gender unfriendly. Uh, put women in a delicate position or at a disadvantage of, of women and draft proposals to change, propose uh, changes, amendments to uh, legal text, uh, for instance. It's also, for instance, working on the empowerment of women when it comes to uh, participate in electoral campaigns, be a candidate, becoming a candidate. Um, it's also, for instance, addressing violence on women in electoral uh, periods, uh, preventing uh, violence uh, against women. So that's the, uh, 
that's the kind of activities we would have in, in the field of uh, gender policy. It's also about how political parties in, in practice can be more, uh, let's say, gender friendly, uh, balanced in the way they organize, in the way they organize their uh, their structures, their meetings, uh, and so on. And so on can be very concrete and, and uh, practical. If you go to our website, uh, www.idea.int, you can certainly find uh, it's a little bit a complicated website, but it's uh, it's very rich in content. You can certainly find uh, interesting documents uh, in that field. I was recently in uh, in Kiev, uh, I think ten days ago or two or three weeks ago, um, and I think what is uh, apart from the very uh, tense situation in terms of geopolitics, uh, there's clearly on the background a geopolitical fight also between Russia and the European Union, or the uh, uh, let's say the uh, the, the the borders that were that were once fixed after the, the new borders are uh, kind of challenged, but within the Ukraine, I think it's it's essential to find a a way of have a peaceful coexistence between the Russophones and the the Ukrainians, the uh, the non-Russophone po population in terms of territory, more or less, uh, the um, the western part of the Ukraine, the central part, and then the eastern part. I think what, for instance, could be learned from the uh, the Belgian example, I hesitate a little bit to, to name it an example, but this, and I put it forward at, at the meeting we had there, there is a part, a very interesting part of the um, constitution in Belgium, which uh, allows to organize non-territorially linked specific rights for language, cultural, linked uh, communities. I mean, in a debate like in the Ukraine, also in the, um, in the war, in the, the conflict, it is um, primarily based on territories. It's the Donbass and the Crimea region where you have a, um, well, majority or not, but a very strong presence of Russophone people that at a certain moment, under influence or not, of the Russian uh, neighbor decides to, um, to ask for uh, more autonomy, uh, even for independence. And uh, it's the existence of these people with the uh, other part of the Ukraine. And when you can, um, let's say, um, break a little bit the link with the territory, uh, the territory, the territorial uh, stance, I think you, are, you can come very far near to uh, peaceful solutions. And so this is a concept, non-territorial linked rights, personal rights to... Uh, to go to to have school in in your own language, for instance, in Russian, to be um, to be addressed by administrations in your own language, to go to uh, uh, hospitals, to have uh, healthcare in your own in your own language. I think this could be really uh, peace bringing or peace uh, keeping. It's one example, but of course the solution has to come from the let's say the political scene in the Ukraine itself. What struck me when I was there a couple of weeks ago, is that there is a need for clarification. Independence is different from autonomy. Decentralization is different from autonomy. And, and deconcentration is different from decentralization. And decentralization is different from independence. And so um, based on scientific evidence, and we were there with even a couple of Nobel Prize winners, uh, delivering some scientific underpinning to the discussion, uh, clarifying the definitions, um, also giving some examples of best practices from all over the globe can really help to, to go towards uh, solutions. Of course, uh, democracy at its own cannot bring peace. So there has to be a, a good will, a, a will to, to, um, um, yeah, to, to solve problems, to settle uh, problems in a peaceful way. This is the precondition for having a successful work uh, to, to uh, obtain uh, results. Um, the question about um, the, um, let's say, uh, how we see democracy, I would, I would like to underline that in the four pillars I gave, it has to be very clear uh, through uh, the description of the four pillars that to our idea, of course, democracy is about m a lot more than only organizing elections. That's uh, sometimes a very limited view uh, people have on how democracy functions. You And sometimes we as Westerners came in a country and said, well, there have been problems, so let's have a uh, peace agreement, organize elections, and then we have a democracy, uh, 
it's okay, it's fixed, and uh, we leave the country. Uh, it's a little bit what at a certain moment happened in, uh, in Afghanistan, for instance, and also in other parts of the world uh, uh, before uh, Afghanistan. We tend to think at the international idea that democracy is about much more than elections. Of course, fair elections um, based on, on a good programmatic debate is key, is very important. And also the, the trust people can have in the uh, procedures linked to these elections is, is very important is, uh, in terms of legitimacy of the uh, executive power and the parliament is, is crucial. But um, what happens in between electoral periods is also very important. It's uh, about the engagement of civic society, civil society in uh, drafting uh, policy. It's about interaction between uh, public authority and, and citizens. It's about bottom-up approach of uh, policy making. It's about a very active participation of, um, of citizens. To give you one example, for instance, we have uh, what we call tools at International IDEA that help people to, as citizens, to uh, interact directly and, and be part of a political debate. It's, for instance, we have the state of democracy. It's a kind of assessment of how democracy functions, and it's based on a questionnaire that has to be used uh, by citizens where people themselves uh, evaluate, uh, on the base I think it's something like 50 questions, 50 issues, they evaluate how the democracy functions in their country or at the local level, uh, the state of the democracy in their municipality or their immediate uh, surroundings. So this would be what I would answer to, um, to the question about uh, how we see democracy. For us, democracy, it's based on rules of the game, the constitution, a uh, very clear and good constitution. It's based on electoral processes that uh, are fair and that are uh, uh, trustworthy, but it's uh, much more about what happens between the elections and a bottom-up good interaction with uh, citizens and population and trying to um, have uh, a good programmatic debate and interaction with the people. First of all, uh, the state of democracy in India, that's what it is about. Uh, I would like, uh, at the plus side, uh, before uh, shortly answer your question, I would like to underline that India is really a very, very interesting, exciting example of a functioning democracy. It's, uh, in fact, the biggest democracy, and I say this with uh, lots of conviction because uh, I'm for the moment reading a very interesting book for those people who are interested in electoral processes. There is a book uh, written by uh, a member of our board of advisors at uh, International ID, Mr. Uh, Kurashi, I think is his name. He wrote a book. It's called, if I'm right, The Undocumented Miracle. It's 400 pages and it describes from A to Z all what is needed to successfully organize uh, fair elections in what is, uh, well, it's not only a country, it's uh, in terms of the size, the volume, the, the number of inhabitants, it's, uh, it's a whole of a continent. We believe um, concerning um, the um, uh, IGOs, NGOs, and their activities towards democracy, that what I just explained, the state of democracy, is, is one of the tools where you can uh, see, if you would go through the questions, um, if people can, where people can really assess the, the quality uh, of democracy, to see, uh, besides uh, elections, whether the system really works and produces the results they deserve. And there I would say that it is obvious that in the case of India, there's still a long way to go in terms of uh, the quality of governance, the quality of policy, um, the delivery in terms of wealth, of uh, equality, uh, of uh, the quality and the level of education, training, health services, uh, and so on, uh, and so on. The difference between the Council of Europe and International ID, but uh, very important difference, uh, not related directly to the content, is the geographical uh, spread of activities. So we work uh, really on a global level. Uh, we work uh, in all places of the world. We are the only IGO with a membership in the six continents, including uh, Australia, Latin America, uh, North American, uh, European member states, African, Asian. Uh, islands from the Pacific, uh, uh, Caribbean, you name it. So we have really a global uh, constituency with 29, 29 member states from all over the globe and also activities in the six continents, which is at the contrary of the Council of Europe. Of Europe. What we don't do, uh, second difference, is to 
be prescriptive. The Council of Europe clearly is a prescriptive uh, institution when it comes to democracy and human rights, including even having a, a tribunal. We, we don't have this kinds of um, practice of um, deciding with a parliamentary assembly. We don't have a parliamentary assembly like the Council of Europe deciding and, and uh, making statements about what democracy is, is in, in uh, country X or I or having tribunals like uh, the what what is uh, related to human rights at the level of the Council of uh, Europe. We have with the Venice uh, Commission or the Venice Committee, we have a kind of overlap in terms of um, uh, constitution building. Um, but once again, the geographical spread there is uh, narrower, but we work very close together with uh, the Council of Europe. Uh, I will represent the International ID. I think it's the 3rd of November at the World Democracy Day, uh, organized in Strasbourg. So uh, we, um, we tend to... Um, to work closely together. Last element, which is, I think, still different to Council of Europe, is that at a certain moment, being prescriptive and also sometimes condemning situations, Council of Europe is less perceived as a neutral institution. Meanwhile, we are still perceived as a technical, scientific uh, research uh, institution or center that is more uh, assessing situation on a neutral basis, of course, starting from our definition of democracy, but a uh, definition which is uh, very broad and gives uh, enough uh, space, room, scope to, uh, uh, well, differences based on specific situations of, uh, of countries. Okay, thank you very much.